Okay. So this evening, our conversation is going to look at the sort of two radical movements that emerge in the period of the, of the First World War and then thereafter, right? So when we last were together, uh, I guess it was April 7th, uh, <clears throat> all those weeks ago, uh, we looked at the First World War and we discussed the causes of it and then the implications of it with things like the Treaty of Versailles. And, and that's where we, we ended the evening. Uh, on April 7th. Since then, we, we have not been together uh, because of uh, I need to cancel one class. And then we also had spring break in there. So here we are a couple of weeks later, and we are going to be looking back at that period. So the period that um, uh, for the, the, the time period for tonight's class looks at the sort of 1917 to about 1933 or so. And then next week, when we come back together, we'll be looking at uh, 1933 and onward. So we are looking at two separate ideological changes that happen in Europe and the political implications of them. So for the first half of class this evening, we're going to be looking at the Russian Revolution of 1917 and then the Civil War that follows. Uh, but we are obviously, because this is a history course, we need to look back a little bit and look at sort of what's going on in Russia prior to the 1917 event. And then we'll turn our attention after the, the first half of class, we'll turn our attention and look at the rise of fascism uh, in both Germany and Italy. So those are the sort of two topics of, uh, of our conversation this evening both of them looking at the, uh, again, the ideological changes uh, in this period. So let us start by looking at the Russian Revolution. So Russia, so before I share my slides with you, Russia uh, is an interesting case, right, in this, in the period that we've been discussing, right? One of the things that we discussed a couple of weeks ago, back in March now, was the, uh, the rise of the czar, the, the Romanov family. And we looked at some of the big political changes that occur in the 1800s. But it's important for us to remember, if you're, and if you're going to put anything in your notes, right, this might be some things that you might want to jot in your notes, right? I mean, when the rest of Europe is experiencing their massive urbanization and massive industrialization in the mid 19th century, Russia is not. Russia does not have the industrial revolution in the same way that the, you know, the British, the French, the Germans, all of those folks do. Instead, their industrialization is on a much smaller scale and a much more localized scale. Most of the people in Russia are living in poverty. Uh, they are living uh, under an op oppressive regime, uh, and you have a major you have major oligarchic families uh, that control vast amounts of wealth and vast amounts of land. So that's sort of the economic situation. Uh, Social, um, I guess, politically. Right, Russia, as I've as I've already in, uh, implied, is under an absolute monarchy uh, in the person of the Czar in the 19th century, and uh, the Czar, right, can exercise complete control, but obviously they have to rule sort of with, um, they have to rule they have to rule with the help of the oligarchs. Russia experiences throughout the 1800s a couple of major blows, right? The first bl big blow that they receive comes in the Crimean War in 1853-4. This war, although short, really hurts uh, Russia because it shows that, because uh, so it's Russia, 
against the Ottoman Empire, the British and the French. And it shows them that they are just not capable of competing with the other, you know, their sort of peer powers as they would have seen it. Their second big blow, and I, this is where we will, I will share my screen. Uh, so you should now hopefully see my slides on the Russian Revolution. Somebody could just give me a thumbs up that they see my slides on the Russian Revolution. Excellent. The, the second big blow that the Russians experience comes in what is called the Russo-Japanese War. So the Russo-Japanese War is a war that happened in 1904-5 between, as the name would seemingly suggest, Russia and Japan. And in this war, Russia and Japan are fighting over uh, sort of a toehold in Manchuria. Russia is defeated in this period, in this war. And this, again, this is just one of another big blows to Russia, because uh, for those of you who, this, is, this has not necessarily been too much of a focus in our class because of, the, of where it is, but Japan is a newly industrialized nation, right? Japan, Japan goes through something called the Meiji Restoration and the industrialization in the 1880s. So Russia, you know, Russia feels as if the, the Russian people feel as if they should be defeating, um, they should be defeating the, um, the Japanese, but their loss, you know, it, uh, gives a major blow to their sort of nationalism uh, and a major blow to their pride. So throughout this period, <clears throat> and then thereafter, there are um, continued sort of feelings of being disgruntled with the president, with the leadership of Tsar Nicholas II and the other major families and, and leadership within Russia. Average Russian people are are you know it, it want the liberalization that is occurring throughout the rest of Europe. And they're just not getting it. They don't have democracy. They have lost a war now. They don't have the industrialization that other countries have. So there is this continued feeling of, of being behind. I will also point out here that Tsar Nicholas II is a unsavory character. People just don't like him. He sort of vacillates between decisions. He's seen as a pushover. He is not very well liked. And one of the big events here is of an event called Bloody Sunday, where uh, average Russian workers are protesting in the streets and the Russian military uh, and Russian backed, um, go or Ru Russian government backed troops fire on a group of protesters. And this is a thing that sort of pushes many people over the edge to ultimately angle for increased democracy and more rights. In order to preserve, in order to preserve his own position, Tsar Nicholas II permits the drafting of something called the October Manifesto. And in this document, he, give, he gives some civil rights to people, freedom of the press, freedom of, of assembly. Um, he gives workers the right to, to somewhat organize. I don't think anybody would call them unionize, but it gives them a bit more privilege. But the big change here is that they create a Duma. Again, put this in your notes. The Duma, the Duma is a deliberative assembly. It's, it's a parliament. Now, 
this parliament is not sort of the open democracy that you might anticipate. Instead, it's extremely limited by what are called the fundamental laws, the constitution of Russia. And it's basically a place for the oligarchic families to exert a lot of control. It is not necessarily, again, it's not an open democracy in the way that you might anticipate. But it is a big step, right? And this is why we call this the Re revolution of 1905 because it's a big step in sort of dismantling that first um, type of Russian authority, absolute monarchy that exists within Russia. So this, again, this is that first step. Now we're gonna fast forward a little bit. World War, um, Je Jeff, are you mentioning, is there uh, Bloody Sunday mentioning uh, the troubles in Northern Ireland? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, so blood, there are a few Bloody Sundays. Um, I know there's a song, YouTube made a song also kind of about that. Uh issues yeah well, that's that's about northern ireland right that's, yeah so it's interesting there's a few kind of events that are named the same yeah sunday's a, a very bloody day evidently um yeah good point um so let's fast forward a little bit to 1914 so we know already, based on our conversation from a couple of weeks ago, that World War I breaks out in 1914. And we know that the Russian Empire sides with the British and the French in opposition to, uh, in opposition to the German and Austro-Hungarian empires. We also know that Britain and France are among the top five industrialized countries in the world in 1904-5. We also know that Germany is among the most industrialized nations in the world in 1904-5. So as a result of that, you have Russia that is hardly industrialized or very meagerly industrialized fighting against some of the most industrialized powers in the world at the time. They are at a severe disadvantage here. And when the war and the fighting ultimately break out, we know already that, the, that a lot of the fighting occurs in the Western theater or in the French German borderlands. But a lot of fighting also happens in the Eastern theater, in the Russian lands, also in Poland, Austria-Hungary, uh, what will become Czechoslovakia, places like that, Ukraine. Um, but remember, again, Russia is not super industrialized. So what is the one thing that Russia sort of always has that they can keep throwing at war? Anybody know? Uh, you go ahead, you and then Zechariah. Oh, uh, the Russian population <laughs> they got a lot of people, they got a lot of people. Uh, they've got just a tremendous amount of people. Uh, Zechariah, any, any comment to add there? No, I was gonna say the same exact thing. Okay, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna add that's kind of like what people are talking about with like Ukraine now, how like they're sending in like waves and because they have so many. You know, obviously, they, people predict it will eventually fall because they'll just send in the waves of like those feeder troops, like those young conscripts, and then just kind of yeah. storm in. Like, you know, yeah, more exactly. troops. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, that's still sort of the strategy that Russia has today, where they just have a tremendous population and they can just keep sending people in. That's a great point. Some parallels, right? So Russia. Uh, can send in the Russian Empire under Tsar Nicholas II can just send in tremendous amounts of troops constantly. 
but again, they are not they are not as industrialized. Um, they are not as industrialized as the rest of the world, and 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 the body bags and the bodies come home, and people are seeing these injured soldiers, and they're hearing the stories, and it is really really difficult uh, for people to justify the war. And the other part of that, remember, is, you know, that I said is Russian troops are um, Russian um, tr- Russian people are largely subsistence farmers who are um, large. They, they are largely subsistence farmers who are sort of uh, living sort of hand to mouth in many cases, and a lot of their food is being taken and diverted to the war front. So people at home are dying of starvation and starvation related diseases. So what you're seeing here is not just death on the battlefield, but people are experiencing death in their own communities. And this is, again, this is turning a lot of people against, this is turning a lot of people against the war effort. uh, And it is turning a lot of people against the government. There's one final piece here to that. In 1916, as the war is going on, Tsar Nicholas II declares himself to be the commander in chief of the Russian armed forces. So that when things are going poorly on the war front, to whom do they point their fingers and to whom do they place blame uh, when the war is not going well? Well, they blame obviously the Tsar. So this guy who was already not well liked and is leading a a war effort that is not going particularly well, people are increasingly disgruntled with. And this all boils over into a head in March of 1917. So we're gonna, uh, so I'm gonna skip this slide on on Lenin for a moment. uh, And we're gonna jump here to this slide, the March Revolution. Um, so the March revolution, so the March revolution is, uh, so in, in, it starts in February. So in February of 1917, again, as the war is not going particularly well, a group of workers, a group of workers that are allowed to sort of have organization after, the revolution of 1905, they come together and they start having strikes in Peter in Petergrad. So St. Petersburg, the, 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 the name, the city of St. Petersburg has had a name change to Petergrad. And they begin striking uh, men and women who are working in the factories. So the factories that are producing the small amount of industrial goods that the Russian army needs have just gone on strike. And this push, this forces, this forces Tsar Nicholas II back from the war front. And he is forced to come back to Petergrad to, to deal with this situation. And within a couple of days, uh, within a couple of days of the first strikes and the first sort of small scale riots, Tsar Nicholas II is is forced to step down from being the the, the absolute monarch, the Tsar of Russia. And Russia now doesn't have a government uh, or well, doesn't have a, an absolute monarchy anymore. And 300 years of Romanov family dynasty has evaporated. Three, um, what, 400 years of the Russian empire has disintegrated. So we are now in a sort of new period of Russian history. And a new government will uh, will be declared. The, the government is called the provisional government uh, that is founded uh, in, in March of 1917. And it is... <clears throat> It is given the right to rule. Now, 
the word, I want you to think for a second about the word provisional. What does the word provisional mean? Zachariah, go ahead. I feel like it means something temporary and for a specific purpose. Excellent. So, I mean, Zechariah, I will just stick with you since your hand was up. I mean, if, if you have something called the provisional government, which you know to be temporary or for a specific purpose, would you put much stake in it? Much, much, would you put much concern to it? I mean, normally I wouldn't, but I would want to say that right after a revolution, you would be very interested in what's going on. Fair enough. Fair enough. But I think most people go with your first sentiment, right? That like, we know it's not really a long-term thing. So we're going to not put too much concern or too much care into it. And that's what really happens, right? There are a lot of people who don't necessarily care too much for the provisional government. And they look instead, uh, you know, the, the, there's, there is an emerging sort of political party system that is that is happening that will start to draw more attention in uh, and look towards sort of the next phase of what the government might look like. And while all of this is happening, a guy named Vladimir Lenin is being brought back from exile. So Vladimir Lenin, let me just talk a little bit about who Vladimir, Vladimir Lenin was. Uh, why he was in exile, and then we'll turn our attention and look uh, at one of his documents. So Vladimir Lenin uh, was a political journalist, a figure who uh, has a very sort of wide readership and, and does a lot of publications uh, in the early 1900s. He is sent into exile in Switzerland during this period, uh, you know, in the early 1900s. And when the war breaks out, when the, sorry, when the revolution breaks out in the winter of 1917, the German leadership, the German empire, the German Kaiser, see an opportunity to destabilize Russia. So they, 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 get, um, they get Vladimir Lenin to go on a train and they take, he takes the train from Switzerland through Germany into St. Petersburg to help stir up this revolution. So it's important for you to be aware here, right? The German government is paying for this Russian revolutionary to be returned to Russia, right? Kind of interesting. And I, I should also point out here, he and in your textbook point in the textbook points this out. Right? He is sent in a sealed subway, uh, subway, a sealed train car that uh, is has guards in it so that he can't get out while it's going through Germany. So he can't influence the people uh, of Germany, which I just think is fascinating, right? That they they know this guy's trouble, so we're not going to let him out of the train car. Anyway. So he, um, excuse me. So he makes his way back to St. Petersburg or Petergrad, and he starts to argue. He starts to argue for a complete overthrow of the Russian Empire of the Russian government, and his goal here is to implement sort of revolutionary communism, Marxist, Leninist communism is what we some which what it's referred to. And he's looking to to um, at, he advocates for um, you know greater industrialization within the urban environments, land collectivization and uh, sort of communal ownership of land out in the in the provinces out in the uh out in the the agricultural areas and again he's really trying to focus a lot on re removing the government removing the state and creating communist a communist country and there are these growing political parties within the government right within the provisional government there is 
Um, there are people who are more moderate, uh, led by, uh, well, I have a, a note here. We're, you don't need to copy this down. We're going to come back to this in a second. But there's a sort of more moderate group led by um, Kerensky, who's in, who, whose name I have here. There is the more radical side, the Bolshevik side, led by Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky. So it's it's a it's a lot of different. There there are growing sort of ideological differences within the revolution, within the the government, attempting to make changes to the uh, to to the government. Right, what's going to happen after the provisional government? And in that right. <clears throat> You have Lenin, you know, by the summer of 1917, by the summer of 1917, he is going to be pushing for more and more um, attention towards this sort of complete overthrow of the uh, existing order. So I want you to look at this document for a second. So this document here uh, is a speech that Lenin gives in the summer of 1917. And in it, he is going to, he is advocating for sort of his idea of what comes next after the revolution, after the Bolsheviks, after the communists have taken over Russia. And for those of you who, who maybe don't know your Karl Marx, right? One of the goals of communism uh, at the end of it is to take away the state, right? That there is no more government necessary because we have sort of reached a utopian society. Um, so that's what he is saying here, right? So the state is a special repressive force. Okay, so how is it that that war? Uh, how does Lenin argue that uh, this the there is this transition from capitalism to communism? What is the process? What does it look like? Uh, Jin, how go ahead? Um, Lenin's right. um, Lenin described that. Like there, the government needed to focus on the bourgeois in order to like increase the communism, which yeah, that's that's the only thing I got. Okay, good. So there's there's a sort of uh, the government needs to sort of start focusing away from the bourgeoisie. Good, uh, Zachariah, go ahead. I feel like this is basically saying that a uh, revolution is the way to get that thought. Revolution of the working class people. Uh, just just for for the record here uh what does he what is the name he gives to the working class people i was specifically trying not to say it because i don't want to have to pronounce it but pro, pro, proletariat excellent well done proletariat right so that those are the terms that marx uses right bourgeoisie and proletariat uh and it is it is this sort of revolution right and he talks about how there is this sort of evolution revolution and evolution right almost in the same way that a, a he points out that a naturalist or a biologist would look at a uh, a species and how they have evolved and that's sort of the how society progresses um, you know I think um, you know he he even points out right, uh, even in the first sentence, uh, the whole theory of Marx is an application of the theory of evolution. It, in its most consistent, complete, well-considered and fruitful form to modern capitalism. It was natural for Marx to raise the question of applying his theory both to the coming collapse of capitalism and the future evolution of future communism. On the basis of the fact that it has its origins in capitalism, that it develops historically from capitalism, that it is a result of the action of the social force to which capitalism has given birth. Right. So where does communism, where does this revolutionary socialism come from? 
it comes from capitalism. It is born from, it is an evolution from capitalism. So it's an important piece for us to see that, right? That, that there is this evolution, revolution, revolution, evolution that emerges here in, in Lenin's documents. So Lenin comes back and he leads this more revolutionary portion, um, this more revolutionary segment of this provisional government. And throughout the summer of 1917, uh, spring and summer of 1917, Russia is really going through just a massive, um, a lot of turmoil, uh, as you would expect in a revolution. So I shouldn't, that shouldn't be surprising to anybody, I suppose. <clears throat> but Russia is going through a lot of turmoil. Uh, and the reason that Russia is going through a lot of turmoil is because um, there are these, there's this growing division among the different political, political parties, right? You have people who are still loyal to the, to the monarchy and still loyal to, uh, you know, they, they, maybe they want some political change, but they don't want to overthrow the government. Uh, and then you have others who are more in the middle, right? You have the, the you remember this, this sort of liberal bourgeois class, bourgeoisie class, this liberal group of people who want some constitutional change, but don't want to overthrow the system. And then you have the more radical groups, the Petergrad Soviet, um, that, uh, you know, that are made up of the workers and the urban poor. Uh, and then you have, you know, you know the soldiers who are sacrificing themselves on the on the battlefield and all these groups of people who are all with all these different constituencies the word soviet the word soviet really just means sort of worker unit or worker collective uh or workers council uh so like when we talk about the ussr right the the um the union of soviet socialist republics right the union of uh, worker collectives, worker group, socialist republics. There's an event there's an event in the middle of uh, there's an event in the middle of the summer in July of 1917 called the July days, very creatively titled, where there are small scale riots that break out in a couple of major cities. They break out in Petrograd, they beat out, break out in, in Moscow. And in the July days, thousands of people are killed by government backed troops trying to suppress these small scale riots. Again, Whenever, whenever these things happen, it pushes people more towards the extreme, right? So the July days do a really great job of pushing people towards the Bolsheviks. And as a result of that, you know, more people support Lenin, more people, more people support Trotsky, uh, the, the gentleman pictured here in the bottom uh, of the screen, uh, and the provisional government is losing more and more of its authority. Okay, so I want to now show you a short clip of a video that is, I just think is fantastic. And as we get to the fall, sorry. Yeah, here it is. So as we get to the fall, um, as we get to the fall of 1917, the Bolsheviks have more and more support from the working class and greater and greater support from uh, these worker collectives throughout the empire, throughout Russia. And by November of 1917, through the assistance of a Red Guard, which, um, uh, which are sort of young working class men and women who are fighting for um, who are fighting for the Bolsheviks and, and acting as sort of the small militia group for them. They wind up seizing government land and government property, and they wind up taking over the country 
uh, the, sorry, I should say the Bolsheviks wound up uh, controlling the country by November of 1917. It is at this point that they form a new government. The government is called the Council of the People's Commissars. Uh, this is a this is the new this is the new government. This is the this is the Bolshevik led government, the radical government that takes over in Russia, uh, beginning in the fall of 1917. They then begin a process of implementing the planned economy that is so much associated with the with the, the communists' rule. Uh, they work on land redistribution. Uh, they work on uh, eradicating and prohibiting government um, private property, and they wind up seizing the land from uh, from uh, you know from the rich oligarchs and others, and they wind up taking it away. And we'll look at that. We'll look at something uh, about that in just a few moments. They also force. They also force, uh, not force, they also uh, finally broker a treaty with Germany. Uh, so this is one of the things I mentioned um, in our class a couple of weeks ago. But when the revolution breaks out, Russia ultimately um, must back out of World War I. And as a result of that, Russia signs a treaty with Germany giving up a lot of territory. Nearly a third of all of their land is given to the German government, uh, to the German empire after this, right? So uh, Poland, Lithuania, Finland are, set, are given over to Germany as part of their treaty ending, uh, ending their uh, time in World War I. So Russia is officially, even though Russia fought on uh, the Allied side with Britain, France, and and ultimately the United States and Italy, um, Russia loses World War One, and they are forced to to forfeit much of their territory as a result of that. Um, and the Bolsheviks now are in control of of Russia. Now it's important for us to be aware here that the Bolsheviks do not have major support in the country, right? They have some support uh, and they, they do, um, you know, they do have elections where they, they win, you know, between 20 and 25% of the, the votes, but there's still a ton of people who just do not support uh, their leadership. And as a result of that, there is a civil war that emerges here uh, to stop to stop the to stop the rule of the Bolsheviks. Uh, so as a civil war breaks out, as I say, between 1918 and 1920, and there are two armies. There's the Red Army and the White Army. The Red Army is the Bolshevik army, and the White Army are the anti-Bolsheviks, pretty much everybody else, right? People who support the monarchy, people who support more moderate forms of the government, you know, pretty much a scattershot of the other populations throughout Russia. What's also interesting here is you also have the British and the French and even the United States supporting the white army. They're supporting the, the czarist rule because they don't want the takeover by the Bolsheviks. The passion for getting rid of the passion for getting rid of the Bolshevik, I'm sorry, the passion for getting rid of the Tsar really bubbles all over here. And Vladimir Lenin winds up taking over through uh, brutality and through sort of the passion for uh, the communist rule. Lenin and Trotsky wind up uh, successful here. And the civil war ends with the communist, with the with the Red Army sweeping through. Um, Leon Trotsky and Vladimir Lenin work then on creating a um, 
a fully socialist government where they have a governmental control and a planned economy. Um, so that, and we'll look at this in just a few seconds, right? Where Russia can start to really ramp up its production. Um, you have the nationalization of banks and, and the taking over of industry and factories. You have a formation of a secret police. You have, <clears throat> um, you have really harsh and extreme repressive measures such as the, um, you, know, you know, such as the uh, limiting of the press and limiting of free speech and any opposition is severely repressed. But they also wind up using, uh, you know, through um, negotiations and through alliances, they wind up forming the Soviet Union, right? The Union of so Soviet Socialist Republics. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I guess sort of has res resonance for today, and maybe I'll, I'll show a map here. You know, if you look at a map of the Soviet Union, you know, if you look at the ma a map of the Soviet Union, right, you have, you know, the Russian Empire as, par as a major part of it. But then it, you know, it does go into Ukraine and it does go into, you know, Ka Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan and, and, and the sort of the, 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 the stands, the, the Muslim stand, um, empire uh, countries to the southeast of, of sort of uh, Moscow and, and Petrograd and all that. You know, through alliances and through connections, the, from Petrograd, you get to, you start to have the different controls of these other, these other places. So this is a pretty good map. Maybe I'll, I'll take that in a few moments. But, uh, you know, again, ultimately, but through the 1920s into the 1930s, through Lenin, well, through first Trotsky, then Lenin, and then ultimately Stalin, by the end of the 1920s, you start to see more, more collectivization and more control coming from, from Russia. So a few moments ago, I mentioned that there is a new economy that's put into place. And that new economy is called the, the new economic policy. So I want to just show you what that means. So Joseph Stalin, who we, we know, right, becomes, uh, as I said a moment ago, he becomes the next leader of the Soviet Union after, uh, after the death of Vladimir Lenin, um, puts into place the new economic plan and, and, and a series of five-year plans. And in this, right, the goal here is for the government to control the output, to plan the output. And it, it is important for us to be aware that the first five-year plan was extremely successful. Uh, the second five-year plan was not quite as successful, but, it, but, but the first one was. So he says, the question of a fast rate of development of industry would not face us so acutely as it does now if we had such a highly developed industry and such a highly developed technology as Germany say. And if the relative importance of industry in the entire national economy were as high in our country as it is in Germany, for example, if that were the case, we could develop our industry at a slower rate without fearing to fall behind the capitalist countries and knowing that we could outstrip them at one stroke. The whole point of this, so skipping that next sentence, the whole point is that we are behind Germany in this respect and are still far from having overtaken her techn technically uh, and economically. The question uh, of a faster development of industry would not face us so acutely if it were not the only, if it if we were not the only country, but one of the countries of a dictatorship of the proletariat. So again, he's he's sort of pointing out here, uh, you know, this sort of competition that's going on, this need for us to sort of catch up. 
I want to move on to the next portion here, right? But anyway, you know, he's go, he advocates here that there needs to be our large scale socialist industry. There needs to be this socialist takeover of industry. There needs to be collectivization. We need to eradicate private property and we need to force our, you know, to, to really ramp up production across Russia, across the Soviet Union. And as I said a moment ago, the new economic plan, is, or sorry, the new economic policy is successful at first. Stalin here is taking words and he's making it sound as if it's an us versus them, right? It is a capitalist society versus a socialist society. And, and you know, we know that the Cold War is 15 years, 20 years in the making here. But the reason that the Cold War ultimately begins is because there are two competing ideologies for what, there are two competing ideologies for what modernization and what the world should look like. And this is Stalin's, this is the Soviet Union's perspective. This is, um, this is it, right? His, his plan here is to develop um, a planned economy, one where there is socialism, one where there is collective or ownership of industry, one where there is collective ownership of the means of production. So this is where we will come to an end with the Russian revolution. I wanna just take a two minute break, three minute break, and then we'll come back and we're going to look at, um, <clears throat> we're going to look at fascism. So uh, if you wanna open up the next set of slides, feel free to do so. Uh, if you want to go, this is this maybe is a good time for us. Just take a break so that we can sort of get our head around uh, the next topic. Um, so again, take it's now seven thirty-two. You know, come back. Let's say. So it's important for us to, to see here, right? That fascism, um, you know, again is is a, is an ideology that is rising at the same time in the nineteen twenties as the Russian government is becoming as is, is putting out their sort of socialist agenda. Uh, and, you know, again, part of this is that, you know, part, another part of this is that, you know, within the last couple of years, uh, you know, as, um, you know, there has been a lot of conversation about fascism here in the United States. And, you know, it's important for us to be aware, right, that, that um, you know, the, you know the, it, fascism has been tied to the Republican Party. Uh, here in the United States and, and President Trump, uh, you know, it is important for us to be aware that that though that the Republican Party uh, and Mr. Trump are, are both are they are not fascists, um, uh, and I and, you know, but but it is important to be aware that you know some of the rhetoric that does come out, it you know does sort of I see, I guess have those tones to it, um, but again they are not, and, 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 and here's here's why or how, I suppose. So let's look at uh, sort of what makes fascism, fascism. So fascism, thank you, Helen. Uh, so fascism is, um, Fascism is a political ideology on the right side, on the on sort of, if you think of a left right spectrum, if socialism uh, is at least theoretically on the left side of the spectrum, um, fascism is on the far right side of it. And within that ideology, um, there is sort of a huge attention or a very large focus to the state and to the people, right? To your group of people, to your nation. And if you remember back to when we were discussing the rise of Italy and the unification of Germany back in March, when we were looking at the mid 19th century, you know, Italy and Germany at that point, were both looking at the nation, right? Who are we? And can anybody remind us 
what was what what is a nation can anybody remind us what is uh when we say a quote-unquote nation what does that mean jeff go ahead um you kind of just think of like a large area of people kind of united by maybe certain traditions, religions, language, you know, and it may not necessarily be like a legal in terms of like a country because like you have like Kurdistan, which is a nation, but it's not a country. So you just have like this large area of like time. Excellent. That's a, that's a great, that's a great definition and, and a great, and a great example. Right. So when we think about a nation, it's important for us to remember, it doesn't have to be bound by any legal apparatus. Right. So it, it doesn't need a government. It doesn't need a set of laws. It doesn't need any of that. Instead, what it does need is a, a group of people who are um, bound together as, as Jeff very light, rightly says, who are bound together by um who are, who are bound to, together by um, a common tradition, to culture, language, history, religion, all those things. And it is loyalty to that state and obedience to that leader that sort of defines um, fascism. And as part of that, right, it is this idea of a collective organization, all for the purpose of preservation of that country, of that state. So within, within fascism, there's even, and, and we're going to talk about this uh, in just a moment, there is a, um, there is state ownership of production. There is state ownership of resources because everything is for the state everything is for the nation everything is for us so because of that the government must own the goods to produce that i hope that makes sense right that might seem counterintuitive but it's important for us to be aware right there is state ownership of production because everything is for the state and and there shouldn't be sort of private ownership because of that and this devotion and this obedience to the state is exhibited in rallies, in speeches, in special uniforms, in ways that, that people sort of view themselves as dressing for the country. Uh, and, and again, if you think back to sort of Nazi Germany, right, there is the connection to, um, there is the connection to, um, you know, the brown shirts and um, things like that. Now, you might think to yourself, right, we just talked about communism and how they had state ownership. And you might think about sort of this, this devotion to us as a group of people. But it's important for us to be aware that fascism and commun communism are not the same thing. And in fact, fascists hate communists and communists hate fascists. Although they are very similar, they hate one another. And here's why. Both are dictatorships. Both have one party system. Both see the, the sort of importance of one entity. But here's why they hate each other. For fascists, they understand we need classes. We need social stratification. Fascists also are all about the state. We are all about us as a group of people. Communists don't believe that. Communists instead believe we are all about the working class. We are all about class consciousness. So as a result of that, they have two diverging views of how to achieve that success. And because of that, they are diametrically opposed to one another. One views it as the state above everything else, everything for us as a group of people, fascism. And communism, socialism, believes in everything for the working class, wherever the cl those classes might be, right? Uh, and if you think back, um, you know, I mentioned this when we did the Industrial Revolution Unit a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, the, the sort of last sentence in, in Marx's Communist Manifesto is workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains, right? Workers of the world. So it's an internationalist perspective. It's a, um, so it's a social class perspective, not a national perspective. Does that make sense? And that's why they hate each other. Yes, I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> so for fascism, for fascism, there is, um, so fascism is a, is a nationalist, um, there's a, there's an attention to the nation. There's an attention, uh, an orientation or a focus on us as a group of people. And the fascist leaders of Italy and Germany use their 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 economic and political situation after World War One to help bring. Uh, a rise to their political ideology. So it's important for us to sort of look at, two, you know, Italy and Germany um, sort of side by side. And we'll start with Italy because Italy is the first place uh, to become fascist uh, after, the, after the end of the First World War. So what happens? So you, I hope you will remember uh, back to a couple of weeks ago, when World War I comes to an end in 19, in June, well, with the signing of the treaty in June of 1919, uh, Italy gets nothing of what it really desires, right? Italy gets, um, Italy gets, you know, Italy wants more territory. Italy wants some, some um, protection, particularly along its northern border from Austria, well, from, from the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, but doesn't get it. Italy also is experiencing another major issue, and that is massive unemployment and massive inflation. I hope you might remember back to our discussion of Italy's unification in the 1800s, that Italy is kind of like a two- tiered economic situation. The, the northern part of Italy, sort of Rome and north, is a massively urbanized, massively industrialized portion of the country. So that you have, um, you know, cent centers like Florence and Milan and Turin that are major economic outputs, right? They have, they have factories and they, they produce they produce tons and tons of goods every year. But you also have Southern Italy, which is a major agricultural uh, area so that they produce a ton of food. When World War I comes to an end, there is now less of a need for food because there are less troops mobilized. There are less... Um, yeah, there are less troops mobilized, people are coming home. So we need less food production. So, so there's a group of people who are going to be out of jobs for that. But also in Northern Italy, we also need less industrial production because we don't need to fight the war any longer. So both sides of, Italian, of the Italian economy are starting to, um, are starting to take, are, are starting to take a hit. And into this mix comes the fear of, um, of communism, right? By, by 1919, 1920, people know what's going on in Russia. They see the, the revolution that has just under, been under, uh, has just gone underway in Russia. They see the rise of the civil war that is going on in Russia. And the working, I'm sorry, the upper class and the middle class are fearful of that. They don't want to see uh, Italy become 
communist as well. And again, remember, they hate one another, fascists and communists. So you can see why that tension would be there. And into this comes Benito Mussolini. So Benito Mussolini was a newspaper editor. He was, um, when, when World War I comes to an end in 1919, you know, he uses this sort of disgruntled, the disgruntled nature of Italy uh, and the feeling of being neglected at the end of World War I to his benefit. And he founds the fascist party in 1919. Really, again, remember, right, just right after the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. And as the economic conditions are continuing to deteriorate, as inflation is rising, as unemployment are rising, he, his party is gaining more and more success because of these fears. In 1922, in October of 1922, so only three years, two and a half years really, after the founding of the fascist party, Mussolini and, and tens of thousands of fascists march on Rome. And they get Victor Emmanuel, the king of Italy, to install him in a political position called Il Duce, the leader. And in this way, he can use sort of, he can become an authoritarian leader. Sorry, I'm sorry about all the uh, formatting troubles here. I don't know what's going on. Sorry about that. So he uses, um, so 30,000 fascists march on Rome in October of 1922, and they get him in, he is installed under Victor Emmanuel as Il Duce. You know, again, the, the sort of, the way that they operate and the way that they administer their 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 political power, right? Fascists and communists kind of look and smell the same. They use authoritarian power. They use dictatorships. They use a repression of rights. They use secret police uh, to to limit expression. But again, they they are diametrically opposed. They do not like one another. Um, Mussolini, uh, and, and they also use propaganda very effectively. Uh, so one of the things that Mussolini does, again, this is the 1920s. This is the advent of, uh, this is the advent of new technologies, right? This is the advent of the radio era. This is when movie theaters are starting to be uh, built and they're starting to, um, Movie theaters are built and they're starting to uh, showcase you know, new movies. Uh, so, <clears throat> so when I first started graduate school, a long time ago now, 15 years ago, I had this old Italian professor who grew up in Italy uh, and in his tiny little town in Southern Italy, uh, before he moved to the United States, his, the movie theater in his town was built under the fascist, under the under the, under Mussolini's leadership, uh, and there was sort of a there was a, a plaque on the wall or a, a key or a uh, what um, you know uh, um, you know a, a stone that sort of had like you know e erected by the fascists under Mussolini, right? And it was and it said you know it said that right? You know they used the the fascist the Mussolini used propaganda. Uh, to talk about sort of the greatness of Italy, <clears throat> the greatness of, of um, you know, sort of looking backward, right? And for Mussolini and for fascists in general, right? One of the things 
that they look back to. Remember, just like, just like all of those Italian leaders in the 1800s, they look back. They look back at um, the Roman Empire. They look back at the times when Italy was great. And, you know, even the name itself, right? Fascism. Uh, does anybody know what the faccia was? Anybody here fans of the of uh, the Roman Empire? What was the faccio? Anybody remember? So the faccio is is this bundle of sticks with a. Um, I think I might have a simple. I might have an image of it here somewhere. No, I don't. Uh, the the um, a faccio is the image is a bundle of sticks bound together with a with a. Uh, an axe at the top, and it was this sort of symbol of the Roman Empire. So even the name itself is supposed to be identifying back to the Roman Empire. And all these things, right, are again, sort of just trying to show the greatness of Italy, trying to show sort of this connection back to sort of the greatness of the, con of the, the country and get people to feel these, uh, this drawing of nationalism. Under, under, um, under um, Benito Mussolini, private ownership of businesses of in, of industry and private and uh, private ownership of land and agricultural land are prohibited, and the reason for that, right, is to produce things for the country. Sometimes this is called the beginning of a corporatist state. So I'll spell that for you. That is C-O-R-P-O-R-A-T-I-S-T, corporatist state, C-O-R-P-O-R-T-A-T-I-S-T. And, and that's what he advocates for, right? So if we now turn our attention to that document, so the, you, I have a speech here um, from, from Mussolini. So it's, this is from 1932, so it's a little bit later, but in this, right, um, in this, he is identifying some of the key features of fascism. So if you could, please, uh, let's take a minute. So it's now 7.58. Let's take a minute or two to read the document. Okay, so what are some key features of fascism, uh, according to, to Mussolini here? Go ahead, uh, Zachariah. Uh, he spoke a bit about uh, basically war being the only way to determine a person's, like, he didn't say it like this, but their true value. Okay, good. So war is a, is a true way to, to sort of de uh, de declare our value. Good. What else? Uh, Gene, how about um, they look towards the future and they don't like they don't do any political events? I said that last part again one more time. I'm sorry. Um, political consideration. Good. So there's a lot of sort of focus on sort of the political considerations and, and sort of looking into the future, right? Why do they repudiate democracy? This is, I think, a really interesting point that he brings out here. Zachariah, go ahead. He argues against the idea that the majority knows what's best simply because it's the majority. Yeah, right. Yeah, the, the you know, average people don't know what's best for the country, right? The country, the, the government, the leaders know what's best for the country. Uh, so it's an interesting perspective to have, right? Just because you're the majority doesn't mean that you know uh, what is right here. Um, you know, and, 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 and they, they repudiate pacifism <clears throat> because... You know, it is in that struggle that we can identify who is us and who is not, right? Who is with us and who is against us. So there is this focus and this attention, you know, again, to the nation, uh, to, again, what makes us us. And it, you know, what makes us us is, is warfare. It's the fight for, you know, for the preservation of our people. So this, along with, you know, the rise of the rise of fascism in Italy, 
you also have the, the rise of fascism in Germany. So we obviously know, you know, I mean, I'm sure many people here know that Hitler emerges out of, so Hitler is not um, born in Germany. He is born in Austria, but he fights, um, he fights in World War I. He is injured in World War I. And when he and when the World War One comes to an end, one of the um, you know he blames uh, the sort of defeat of Germany and the German Empire on the leaders of the government, and he joins the Nazi Party in the, in 1920, and he winds up working his way up uh, the ranks through sort of charismatic speeches. Uh, and support from the middle and lower classes. One of the things that Hitler is going to prey upon, right, is the Treaty of Versailles and the massive uh, debt that Germany is under, the stripping away of colonies, the stripping away of territory that occurs as a result. So what happens here is uh, what happens here is Germany becomes in, people. The people of Germany become infatuated with with Hitler because he um, because he's sort of hitting the nerve of of what they what what people were feeling. Um, he also uses you know and, and another piece of this right is he uses. Um, uh, he uses scapegoats, right? So he, you know, we, we, we famously know, obviously, the anti-Semitic feelings that he has and things such as the Night of the Long Knives in 1933 and, and other um, Kristallnacht, uh, uh, the, um, the Night of Broken Glass in, uh, uh, in what, uh, uh, 1934, right? So you have all these different events that are, um, you know, that, that, that he uses the government's abilities to uh, become, uh, to use them as scapegoats, right? So he sees it, he tries to see, he, I'm going to go to the next slide in a second, but I just want to put this up here for just for to point out two things. What, number one is he is, uh, he attempts to seize power in 1923 with a attempted coup called the, the uh, Munich Beer Hall Pushed, where he tries to overthrow party leadership or governmental leadership, and he is unsuccessful. He is thrown into jail. Uh, he's thrown into jail, uh, and this is where he dictates and writes Mein Kampf, My Struggle, uh, sort of his famous manifesto. It's rambling. It's It's... Uh, it's seemingly unintelligent at points, uh, but he lays out his, his views there. And one of the views, you know, again, as I've said, um, uh, one of the views that, that I've already sort of it, it implied here is sort of the scapegoating and the looking down upon other, uh, other religions and other groups of people. But one of the other ideas that he um, espouses in this book is the idea of Lebensraum. So the word Lebensraum translated into English uh, means living space. So the idea here in Lebensraum is to take over uh, other parts of Europe. So take, oh, sorry. Um, take over other parts of Europe. So take over Poland and Austria and uh, the Rhineland in uh, Eastern France and Czechoslovakia and take over these places uh, and kill off the people who live there and replacing them with, with Germans. Uh, and this, is, this then gives them the, the places that they can grow food and grow wheat to sustain their their own um, sustain their their populations. 
again, by, by talking about the Versailles Treaty and, and the sort of ways that Germany had been so disrespected and wronged in that treaty, Hitler was, was hitting on a nerve uh, that, that, that many people were feeling, right? I'm sure many of you know that Germany was extremely bankrupt at, the, at this point under bad leadership in the Weimar government. Uh, and it is, you know, it is the bad economics that Germany is experiencing that draw a lot of people towards the Nazis. Uh, it is also true that after the stock market crash in October of 19, so I'm sure many of you know that in, in October of 1929, there was a stock market crash that began, the, that, that is one of the first indicators of the, the Great Depression. After that stock market crash, more people wind up joining the Nazi party, right? So it is the econo it is economic situations that draw a lot of people towards Hitler. Finally, Hitler's popularity is, is, is ascending and Hitler then is capable of consolidating power. And this is how he does it. Just before the elections are to occur in 1933, there is a fire in the, the German parliament, the Reichstag. And Hitler uses that fire and uses propaganda to blame the communists. In this in this election, the, the major, the two sort of major political parties were the communists and the Nazis. Both were appealing to the working class. Both were appealing to people's sense of uh, being, uh, you know, the, the economic situation that was occurring in Germany. And when Hitler pins the blame on the communists, which was not true, people switch sides to the Nazis. And in the election of 1933, Nazis and Hitler wind up winning the election. And Hitler becomes the chancellor of Germany in this election of 1933. He goes to uh, the president of the country and he says, I want to be declared Fuhrer the leader. And I want to be given this power for four years. The next year, 1934, he is declared Fuhrer for life. So he quickly goes from, he quickly goes from outside the government to leader of the government, chancellor of, the, of Germany, to Fuhrer, to Fuhrer for life. And just like South, uh, just like to their South, in Italy, Hitler and the Nazis start to consolidate their power and start to become increasingly repressive. So there is the banning of, uh, of other political parties. There is the banning of free speech. There is the, there is, there is the banning of, of publications that are not allowed, on, you know, that are not uh, ordained by the government. There is the burning of books. There is the burning of books that are not, uh, again, approved by the government. There's a secret police, the SS and the, 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 um, uh, the, the Gestapo that wind up using terror to, to enforce obedience. There is uh, obviously, you know, the anti-Semitic laws that are put in, right? In 19, uh, 1936, you have the passing of the Nuremberg laws that require people of Jewish faith to wear the stars of David, uh, to, to, to put signs that this, you know, that, they're, that a business was owned by a Jewish person. There was this scapegoating and this targeting of others that existed in Germany 
in order to, um, uh, in order to again, um, consolidate power and uh, you know limit opposition. Again, just like in Italy, there is the governmental takeover of businesses, uh, so that the government takes over industries and takes over farming, uh, prohibits strikes, prohibits unions, prohibits anything that is going to stand in the way of the success of the country. Again, everything is for the country. Everything is for, um, everything is for um, the party, the Nazi party. <laughs> These radical ideologies that we've been discussing tonight, in many ways, whether it's the, whether it's communism or fascism, you know, we sit here nearly a hundred years later. Uh, I guess in the case of the Soviet Union uh, in the Russian Revolution, we stand here uh, uh, over a hundred years later, uh, but coming up on a hundred years for for Mussolini uh, and Hitler, you know, we sit here. And we think, you know, looking back, that the rise of these radical ideologies, you know, seemed inevitable. But for the people living in their moments, right, these were not inevitable situations. This was not the sort of logical outcome. Instead, it it was a series of unfortunate events that people were convert, you know, people living in dire situations, people living in poor economic situations, were were coerced and were manipulated to believe that to believe things that that obviously were not true and you know i think <clears throat> that is one of the, you know that is one of the fears that we always have to live with here in the united states and and globally right that there are the there are these people around the world that that are easily uh coerced and, and, and manipulated to believe things um but at any point, you know, there could have been people to stop this. Uh, but because of fear, because of repression, because of violence, uh, that that didn't happen, right? I mean, we talked about a, mo a couple of moments ago that the Bolsheviks did not even have, you know, 30% of the vote. For Hitler, he did have over 50% of the vote, but it was through manipulation and propaganda. And it's important for us to be aware, right, that that um, you know, these are things that, 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 that are still out there and we still need to always sort of be vigilant that there are these, you know, that there, there is this potential. Now, again, I'm not saying that we have to necessarily worry about that too much here in the United States. We do have, you know, institutions, but, but again, it, it no one would have thought it was going to happen in Germany either. So there you go. Um, so we will pick up here next week when 